så vi får lige få opvist noen flere. Men vi tenker at alle som har kommet, og så har vi fantastisk besøk fra utlandet. Det store utlandet Danmark. Hildur og Ross, de har jo vært virkelig av de store forkjemperne for Rødbosanten og Øvnlandsby. De startet jo Guide Trust for 25 år siden, og har også vært medvirkende til å starte på Ica Village Network, som er det internasjonale nettverket. Og de har også skapt noe som heter IDE, som er Guide Education. Og det kommer de nok til å fortelle masse mer om, så jeg tenkte overlate ordet til dere. I'll leave it up to you. You're going to speak in English, Rose, and he'll speak in Danish. Slow Danish. Slow Danish. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone has a problem with Danish? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Let me just mention that Hitler and I, we work as a, a team, and we always have done so. And so we're that's the leading presentation now, today. Hitler has always been a grassroots person. And, and I've always been a uh, corporate executive type, you see, so we're very, very different in that regard. But nevertheless, we agree on, on a lot of things, you know. And uh, I'd like to start just to tell you a little bit about my background, so you can see where I'm coming from on this. Uh, I'm originally from Canada, but I've been living in Denmark now for most of my life. I came originally just with the idea of staying for a couple of years and then went back. My plans got completely destroyed when I met Hitler. <laughs> so I'm still here after all those years. You know. So I worked for a while uh, in the, as a management consultant. I had uh, studied physics, business administration, and later operations research, which is a special branch of economics, using quantitative methods for solving problems of any kind. Basically, mostly business problems, but also government using computers and that sort of thing, which was very new back in the 60s, and so we had a very exciting period, my partner and I, uh, developing models for the Danish industry for a number of years. But then around 1971 or 72, I got also very interested in the environment. You remember the book called The Limits to Growth? Well, that made a great impression on me, because it was a model which was taken directly from my own professional field. And I thought it was a <coughs> tremendous um, success in that it took a very, very complex problem and reduced it down to something which was understandable and which had a very, very important message that in the longer run, looking ahead 50 to 100 years, it looks like we're, we're heading for a very, very major crisis, globally speaking, you know, with population growth, with uh, increasing pollution and so forth. Um, we looked like we were heading for some very major problems. And that had a big effect on me, and I began to uh, study up on the whole issue on the side, pretty much, uh, while I was continuing my business career. And then around uh, in the 1980s, <coughs> Hildur and I decided that uh, we would form a guy trust. And this is the, this foundation. This is our, actually our 25th anniversary this year. We have a little publication here. If you haven't seen it, I'd recommend you having a look because it has a number of wonderful pictures from eco villages all around the world. I actually organized as a postcard. So you can actually either send a message or you can keep it as a collector's item. So what I'd like to talk about today is, is more or less from the, sort of the global context. I'd like to put the eco village movement in, in the context of what's happening globally. And Hildur is going to go in more detail with individual projects and what we've been doing on the ground. So what about the to start with <coughs> is to uh, I don't have to tell you about all the problems we're facing in terms of the environment. 
Um, but one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, what is the best approach? How do we try to uh, take some kind of action in order to try to reform and to change the system? And there are many, many different approaches. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of NGOs around the world working in different areas. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, there are those two, two different major approaches. One, one is what I would call advocacy. That is to take, to take a particular item. It could be like something like Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth or C50.org and so forth, where you have a particular issue and you try to raise awareness. It's basically a question of raising awareness so that the politicians and other decision makers can make the necessary changes in the society. The other approach is to take a more personal uh, view of things and say, okay, like, like Vandy once said, uh, if you want to change the world, begin with yourself. Be the change that you want to see in the world. And it's in this category that groups like the Interbridge Movement, uh, the Voluntary, the Simplicity, and uh, very other, various other <coughs> types of strategies which are based on personal commitment come in. But there's a major problem here. I call it the structural problem. And this is, this is something which has become more and more clear to me uh, as, as the years have gone on. <laughs> if we look back over the last, say, 40 or 50 years, there is no end to the number of studies that have been, reports that have been written, uh, very serious uh, reports, appeals. For example, in 1992, a number of the leading uh, scientists in the world put forward a, a recommendation to the politicians that we have to do something serious because we're looking at, at terrible problem on the environment, we don't act. But the governments have not acted. Even in the video plus 20, we were there in June, and this was a tremendous disappointment. There was no commitment by any kind by the governments. And so why is this happening? And I think one of the problems is that it's a, it's a what I would call a flaw in our democracy. We have this flaw that it, it, our democratic system, which we, we think is, means one vote to every person, doesn't work that way. We, we give a disproportionate influence to the corporate sector. Not only during the election periods where they can support politicians with their, with their funds, but also between elections. Who do the politicians talk to when they're talking about new legislation? They talk to the large corporate corporations in their countries. And that's, I think, one of the problems is that, that the corporations have had so much influence that it's almost impossible to change the structure. This is particularly true in the United States where they've basically taken over the whole system into the Congress. So, what do we do about this? Well, I'd just like to mention, um, going back to God Trust, uh, let's say 20, some 20 years ago, we, we, we asked ourselves this question, once we had a little bit of money to work with, how can we best use the limited funds that we have? We considered many different possibilities. Some people thought, well, we should do a think tank, you know, we should do some more studies. Um, and both Dipper and I, coming, even, we were coming from very different directions, I should, as I mentioned. We, we agreed that that was not the way to go. We had enough reports. And the insight we had was that we know what the problems are. In fact, we know what the solutions are. The real issue here is implementation. It's a question of just going out there and doing it. And that's why we decided to support the Eagle Village Movement. Because these were the people who were actually doing it. They were actually using their personal lives to change the lifestyle, and to go out there and demonstrate what we have to do if we're going to do it in a sustainable way. This is what I call leading by example. This is perhaps the only kind of leadership that is really worthy of the name. And this is what people villages are doing, and also the others who are whose strategy is, is to, to begin with themselves and their personal commitment be the actual change that they want to see in society. But the question then is, is that enough? Is it enough to act from the grassroots and the bottom when we have this tremendous structural problem? And uh, thinking about that problem for the last many years led me to, to write this book, which I call Occupy World Street, which you see, I think you can see a flyer on your Desks there. This is an attempt to analyze the economic problems and to suggest some solutions. And uh, in this connection, uh, I've lost my text there. But what I wanted to close off by saying was that I believe that at the global level, level there is an analogy to 
the way we were thinking about the eco village movement. And that is this, this idea of leading by example. And so my suggestion on the global level in my book, Occupy Wall Street, is that what we have to do, because we can't tackle the structure directly, it's too powerful, but we, what we can do is develop an alternative, a very small alternative on the ground that people can actually see. And the way to do this, in my opinion, is that some of the smaller countries, some of the, particularly the, some of the developing countries, but also a country like Norway, in fact, is, is one of the ones on my list in my book that had the potential to actually to say to the rest of the world, we are going to adopt a new kind of economics, ecological economics, which puts sustainability at the very top, and everything else below. Saying survival of our species is, is really the most important thing of all. And so we have to make this change. And by actually making an organization of a number of these small countries to do the same thing that we're doing in the eco village movement but on a global scale, to actually lead by example and say, this is what we all have to do. And initially, we do it among our small, maybe 26 or 7 small countries, and then invite others to join. In this way, perhaps, if they're successful, and if, they're, if the rest of the world continues to fall apart, then <laughs> gradually others will join. And so that's a, more or less what I want to say today. And uh, with that background, I'd like to uh, ask Linda again to carry on. And uh, Paula, tell us a little bit about what's been happening on the ground. Det var spændende at arbejde sammen med græsrødder i hele Norden og med øh, forskerverdenen. Øh, 
Øh, og vi lavede en masse seminarer og møder, og vi lavede det der, som jeg har et billede af her i Idedys, hvor, hvor vi fik præmier til skoleklasser i de norske, nordiske lande for de bedste input til den her Idedys. Øh, det skulle ikke have konkurrence, det skulle have en dyst, fordi vi, vi skulle lægge lidt afstand til konkurrence sammen. Men øh, vi havde nogle fantastisk spændende år, og det var enormt dejligt at arbejde sammen med både græsset og forskere i Norden. Og der kom en, en række ting ud af det. Der kom en række forprojekter, der kom bøger, der kom øh, ting og sager. Og på et tidspunkt så, øh, fordi vi ikke fik penge i Danmark, og også fordi, at, at der var uenighed om, hvad der skulle med i sådan et projekt. Altså i Danmark, der var der problemer med det spirituelle, med at tage et spirituelt verdensbillede med. Det blev der problemer med, så derfor så trak jeg mig ud af projektet, og så faldt det sammen, fordi jeg var den, der sad og koordinerede det. Så det var selvfølgelig ikke så godt, men, men øh, jeg lærte utrolig meget af det her, og jeg fik en utrolig tillid til mine egne idéer om, hvad det er, der skulle ske, øh, og at græsrødderne virkelig havde øh, de gode idéer. Og at det handlede ikke om at lave flere rapporter, fordi de rapporter, der blev skrevet, det var fine, men de blev aldrig brugt til noget. Det, det handlede om, det var at prøve at implementere det, som også siger, at prøve at vise i praksis, at det kan lade sig gøre. Og vi valgte den strategi med at støtte økosamfund, som vi kalder det i Danmark, Ecovillages økosamfund. Øh, fordi at det er folk, der i mange år allerede har prøvet det. Det vil sige, at det bygger på erfaringer, på virkelighed, på noget, alle folk kan gå ud og se. Og i et økosamfund, der ser du en synergi. Det er ikke bare vedvarende energi, og et andet sted, så kan man lave økologisk jordbrug, og et tredje sted, der laver man nogle sociale projekter. Her, der er det alting samlet, og når du kommer ud og oplever det, og oplever det, hvad det betyder for dagligdagen, så bliver folk virkelig meget begejstrede og overbevist, og det ændrer det. Så de siger til de folk, der har været på sådan et ophold i økosamfund eller kurser, at det har forandret deres liv. Forstår I, hvad jeg siger? Taler jeg for hurtigt? Ja, ellers lov at sige til og stands mig, ikke? Okay? Jeg, jeg, jeg kan godt tale på engelsk, hvis det er bedre, men jeg har skrevet det her på dansk. Ja? Hvad siger du? Ja, det er faktisk. Ja, det er faktisk. Ja, det er You want it in English? Yes, please. Jeg kan stå lige. Det er sådan, at jeg skal få sammen igen. Hvad siger jeg? Kan vi sætte penge? Hvor mange synes, det er bedst, hvis det bliver på engelsk? Det er det ikke, at det må være dig, der beslutter det ikke. Men er det noget, som er problemet at forstå det engelsk? Det er et spørgsmål. Er det ingen, som er problemet med det? Fordi da er det jo mulig at gå om det. Okay, der er tre, der er kun forstår det engelsk. Er der tre personer? Ja, der er det. Så det er det, som er problemet med det. Er det okay for dig? Ja, ja. Uh, this is the place where we moved to in Northern Jordan to create an eco village ourselves. Uh, and from there we uh, invited to the creation of the Global Eco Village Network. We had two meetings in 91 and 93, and then in 95 we went to Findhorn. Uh, and started the whole thing, and then it was inaugurated formally in Habitat 2 in Istanbul. And for that meeting, I edited this little booklet that I have a few copies for people who want them, if you have an eco village who would like to have it, for historic reasons, you're welcome to take one of these booklets. Yeah, in here there's a picture of the founding group on, at Finhorn. And I couldn't find that picture to get it onto the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, but you can see here, and the names are here if, if you're interested in the historic things. So this is a farm in the northwestern part of Jutland, where we moved uh, together with a group of people to create an ecovillage ourselves and to have the office for the global ecovillage network for such many years. When we met them in 95 at Finhorn, we tried to define what, what is it that we want to do. At that time, the word eco-village was hardly uh, invented. So 
So we try to find it out. What is it that we want to support? What is sustainable development for us? What are the important parts of it? And I want to say that we have invited only projects that we felt covered a holistic concept where they had also the spiritual part, a different worldview as part of it. Because I felt that without that, that was my experience from the Nordic Alternative campaign, without that new worldview, it wouldn't work. So we invited only projects that had this holistic concept. Uh, so we put up on, on the blackboard all the words that we felt were important for what we wanted to create. And it very clearly shaped itself into four groups. And this is what came out of it. When I sat back home and we writing a report, I collected it in these four groups and we worked with that for many years. And that's what has actually manifested into the uh, into the what we call the mandala, which is the foundation for the Gaia uh, Gaia education. You pro probably all know that mandala. Have you seen this, all of you? Hmm. Not all of you. Okay, but it will come. But so this was the beginning, and then it transformed into this. The idea was to make a circular worldview, that's why we have had this uh, figure where, where you can see it's circles in a way. We have to think in whole circles, and this was like a way of city uh, thing. And in order to all this get it really flat, never mind. So this is then in order to find out who could become members of this uh, network, we needed to find a way of of, sit, of seeing how far work. How far had the economies come? How far were the ideas? So you could fill out one or more of these uh, four uh, quarters to show what were your main interests. It was, it was evident that they, all the economies were very different, had different priorities, but we saw that as a strength. But it was also interesting to see that very quickly what came out of meeting was that way that they all started learning from each other. They all wanted to know and learn from what the others had been doing. So today, and we have never had any discussion, even the definition of what ecovis is. I know that people write theses about it, but in the moment it has never been an issue. We never even once discussed it. So I don't want to start that one issue. Because it's, it's the idea that in a way that we're trying to create a new culture. And you start in many ways, and any way you start is good. And when you meet, you, you influence each other, and you find a way forward. We went to Habitat in 96. This was a, a big global conference on how to create settlements. And I just took this picture because every day when Guy Matai came to our exhibition, we had actually the biggest exhibition of the whole a habitat. We had a beautiful corner. We built a, a stone house in the park, like from the way the Turks did thousands of years ago. And we had dancing every day, and we made 40 workshops. And we had 20 people there for two weeks, so it was like a major manifestation. I saw the whole conference with that guy in Italy. She came every day to our place. And she said this was the only place she felt at home at the at the whole habitat, which of course we felt very happy about because I really came to love her very dearly. And I sat crying at, in front of my TV when she was given the Nobel Prize here in Norway, and I took it on the tape. I thought it was so great that she got this. You all know that guy Matai, eh? Yeah. So these are the people who made the networks. They travel all over the world. Declan, he made networks in Europe. Now there are 20 networks in Europe. Albert Bates, he traveled the States and South America. And, and Max Lindegger, uh, to the right, he, he's from Crystal Waters in Australia. He covered all of Australia, Oceania, Asia. And he has been traveling and teaching in 61 countries. I, I always call them the four musketeers because it was strange making a Gaia organization 
uh, calling it Gaia and really having thinking that the feminine was so important and then have four men being the ones to create the networks. <laughs> so I had to find a way of, of dealing with that. So I always call them the four musketeers. <laughs> Make it easier. You know? It's always easier when you laugh a little bit. But they were very special men. They were very... I, the, I can say that's one thing that's interesting. I was part of starting up the red stockings in Copenhagen in when, when that happened in the, in the late 60s. And what has been incredible for me to work with this uh, project, there is no gender issue at all. It never comes up. It's not interesting anymore. Because the men and women, they work together on this. And there are no conflicts around gender. And I think that's, in many ways, the most beautiful part of it. And the children have such a great time in the careers. So here, that's where Declan, that's the first meeting when we made the, uh, the European network. Declan standing, his very strong dancing legs, uh, riding in the free. All our meetings are out in the open in the air. It's a very different uh, kind of organization from sitting at the desk in the, in the cities having four meetings. It's always been fun and very uh, lively and out in nature which I really like about it. And here Declan, he is in the first European board and see the women, they, they really have a strong position <laughs> in, the, in the network. This is a, a board meeting in South America, uh, which I think is a, a fantastic picture. But we have many, many more regular pictures. So where is Jen today? I thought that I'll just give a very short overview of where Jen is today, the Global Equities Network. Oh. <laughs> I'm afraid it's my will. <laughs> okay. You are there, 20 national networks. Jen Africa was just started, they had a meeting in, in, uh, in Egypt, and they have had meetings in South, America, uh, South Africa and in Senegal, and they have created the network. And the head of that work is Kasha, she grew up in South Africa, and for that reason she has felt really, really eager to get Africa to be its own. In the first years we had only three offices, one for Europe and Africa together, now they have their own network, and the same in the Americas. This year, down in in Rio, the South American network was inaugurated. So now we have offices, major offices in all the uh, uh, parts of the world, which is great. And in Asia now, Max has withdrawn, has been the one holding it for quite a few years. And Michio Kurohashi, she is like a Japanese living in the Konohana family, which is a fantastic project. So these are just uh, some of the gen. Uh, people, the girl in the middle, it's Taisa from uh, Brazil, uh, and she is one of the organizers of the uh, South American network. And I mean, the picture shows the joy and the, the that is in what we are doing. And I think that's what really makes it a, a, a strong thing that people really have their hearts in what they are doing. So now I'm coming to, to talk a little about Gaia Education. Gaia Education and Jen, we lived in the same place in, uh, in Rio, and it has become much closer to each other. In, uh, in um, 1998, the, the Gaia Education was started. We were discussing of whether we should just make uh, continue permaculture, but we thought that we would like to have it clearly defined that the, I went to a permaculture co conference in New Zealand and I stayed in the same house as Bill Mollison with eight women. It's the only time in my life I felt like I was in a harem, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there was really, it was not clear what the status of the spiritual was in it. Half of the people thought that was important to have it and the other half they, they got really angry when you talked about it. And I thought, I want, to, I want them up to be part of an organization where this is not discussed. This is how it is, and if you don't agree with that, you go somewhere else. But on the other hand, we feel that permaculture is one of the most important parts of what we're doing. 
Uh, and I think that the permaculture movement has changed a lot since then. But just to give you the background for why we started something new like ecovillages when we could have continued with permaculture, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any um, conflicts between the two movements. And I think that it's fine that we have different uh, ways of doing things. So, in, in what we are doing, the spiritual and the social has as strong a uh, placement as the ecological and the economic. So, this is a meeting that, that the uh, Global English Network and the Ghana Education and the Transition Town people in Rio made for us. So it, down there, the transition town and the guy education is the same thing. They don't distinguish. It's interesting to know that's possible, especially because it's very strong in the big cities. And in the big cities, you don't build, build ecovillages, but you make transition projects. So for that reason, it's natural. So now I'll talk a little about guy education, which was started in 98. This is a picture. It's taken from uh, Linus Garden sitting in the middle. Always in a circle. I actually invited to this meeting to celebrate my husband's 60th birthday. And Max was the birthday on the same day, only it's 12 hours apart on the other side of the world, but it's the same day. So we felt this was a good occasion to, to get together and create something new. So that was to create this education. I felt that. The, they all wanted to be part of it, and they all wanted to, to make it into a university eventually. So that was the beginning of it. We were 55 people from as many equivalents uh, all around the world. And uh, this is uh, the... <laughs> it's supposed to be a circle, but it's sped up there. This is uh, the curriculum that we work with. We have these four dimensions that we talk about. When you make it, uh, it, it, the first uh, education we have made is called the easy equivalent design education. Then later we also have a, a virtual version of it on, on, over the internet in eight months course. This is the one month course, four weeks. And you can split it up and have it a week at a time. You can have two weeks at a time or you can do it in weekends. All, you are an idea just as you do with the permaculture. Depends on what feels right for you. And you can, it's okay to say that we want to focus on permaculture, <coughs> the logical part of it. It's okay to, to distribute it a little differently, but mostly people feel very happy with this uh, uh, learning all those things because you really need that to create an ego. And here is a map which is like two years old about where we are teaching. And this is a map from here. So you see how many new places come in. And uh, anybody wants their, uh, their work to take this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation and put it down there. No more sticks. And these are pictures from the the geese meeting. Geese, we call ourselves geese. These are, this is a symbol. Geese, they fly all over. They fly, fly in flocks. And there's a mother goose taking the lead. And when she's tired, <coughs> she goes back and somebody else takes the lead. This is how we think of ourselves as educators, uh, guy education uh, educators for a sustainable earth. We, met, we have met in many parts of the world. We meet, meet, we meet each uh, one and a half years. And the, we have been in Hungary, and in Thailand, and uh, Finhorn, and uh, Solheimer. In Solheimer, in Iceland, three years ago, we celebrated Ross's 70th birthday and Max's 60th birthday, which was fun. And last year we were in Denmark uh, on our farm, which is Du Mosegå, a little north of Copenhagen. And uh, you will recognize some of the people there. You can see Declan was there. <coughs> Makako, <coughs> left from Damanhur. Uh, 
people from Africa who was his in the African network, a very, very strong active person in the African network. And Michio from the Asia, she is also there, where she is the second from the left. And at least you all know her, don't you? And John George from the Indian network, which has also uh, become very strong. I mean, you probably <coughs> have heard of uh, 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 hear about many of these things. And it's, we had a week together, and it was just a wonderful experience. One day, we, we did a lot of dancing in between to get your exercise. And one day, I just thought it was so fun with all the men <laughs> dancing together. I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere before, have you? Yes. Yes? Where? In Valdesen, yes. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it's great. So, we together, we, when we, at the first meeting at Fenthorn in 2004, we, we made four groups who each should write the curriculum for one part of the curriculum, and the social group, and a, a worldview group, and an ecological and an economic group. And we sat, and, and people were placed in, all over the world, and we sat interacting by, over email and getting them together. So when the four things were together, then Chris Mayer from the States, he put the whole thing together in a curriculum, which was um, this one. No, this is, this is a new one. This is the old one. So this is eight, uh, eight years ago. And this curriculum now is in nine languages, and you can all download it for free on the internet. That was the idea that as much as it should be uh, for free for people. And to go with this curriculum, we have been producing four books, one for each of the sections, uh, a social book, and uh, this is a worldview book, an economic book, and then an uh, economic book, and then the uh, ecological book. And they are also free to download in English uh, from our website. But they will very soon also be in Portuguese and Spanish, and then people will have to pay for it because Gaia Education needs some money. We have been funding it all the time, but we need to, they need to become independent, so now people have to pay it. But you can still download it for free in English. So these are the Gaia Education programs. It just to give you an idea of that it's, it's truly global, which is incredible. And what I also think is incredible is that we have this curriculum where we, where we deal with worldview and social stuff and that we never have had problems with it. I think that's fantastic that we can cooperate all over the world in 35 countries where we have been teaching. We can use the same curriculum. That the worldview part of it is broad enough uh, to cover what people really feel about spirituality. So this are the programs, uh, it's already two years old. Uh, these are the programs that have been planned, there are constant new programs in here. These are the programs in the Americas, here in Europe, and in the Middle East, not so many in the Middle East, and in Asia and Oceania. We have now had 135 programs in 35 countries, which and it's constantly expanding, so we feel it's been like a real success story that this has been possible. And uh, what is another thing is that, that uh, so these are the different books that I just showed you. You know the names of them. What has been the really nice is that the United Nations, that they have really adopted what we are doing and supported fully and put it on their web pages. Uh, UNESCO, uh, UNESCO part of the United Nations, uh, they have this 10 year for education for sustainability and they feel that we are like a very important representative of what has happened those 10 years. We also publish a newsletter and all the newsletters so far are collected in this year, up to this year, so you can have a look. It comes out four times a year. There are reports from the different courses and stories and news and... 
this is the way of keeping the contact with all the, the students afterwards. two hours a day, and then you can take the same as this uh, at home with your computer. Of course it's not the same that you don't have a group. But uh, I taught one of, one, one of the courses on uh, the, the word group about module, and it was amazing how much fun the students had of, of being in contact. They're all kinds, so not only they read some text, but then they have assignments. And they have a forum where they discuss. There's like a lively contact between all the students, even if they sit in different parts of the world. And it's fun to, to hear about the personal experiences so far away from where you are and in so different circumstances. So it's working very well. Uh, and it's, it's done through what OUC, the Open University of Catalonia in Spain. The next are some pictures and some uh, from different modules. This is like a lot of design uh, and there are pictures of the green building and so forth. And I took it because the, it gives a little impression of what, what's happening all over the world because of these photos. It's my East with our mother goose and has been since 2004 who has gathered these pictures. I don't think it would make sense to start discussing all that because that's something you all know. It's just uh, seeing the pictures give you a, a feeling of green building. It happens all over the planet. And, uh, Food. And it has to happen around 
the cities and in the suburbs and around ecovillages will have to create many more ecovillages, many more decentralized local structures all over the Western world. And they, in, in, in the, and we have to deal with that. We cannot go on feeding the cars with mice, with corn. Eh? That we will probably this winter see a very strong debate in the U.S. because they are using so much of their corn crops for for to run their cars. And when people are getting hungry and the prices of wheat go up and uh, corn are doubling, we'll have a really really strong debate of uh, abandoning that. Okay. Time to show. I see we are. And I think it would be fine if the ecovillage movement could be part of creating such plans where we create plans for how we should we uh, transform local food production into local food production from the mega structures we have today. This is, a, this is the, from the Falke Center too. The leader of that, Harry May, or he's been called Mr. Windman in many places. Because the closer you get to him, the more windows in the whole world. <coughs> so that has been functioning also as an ecovillage for many years. So what I talked about, uh, low food production will also happen about many other kinds of production. I think that in many ways we'll go back to some of the production and structures we had earlier, using natural materials instead of plastic and things. And I think we'll be much better off for that. I, I think it's going to be nice and, and uh, we'll have to revive uh, old skills. Like wood. a lot of stuff will be made by wood again. We have a lot of wood. It's, it's beautiful, it's lasting, it just takes a little more time. We'll have to create an economy that will allow us to work with wood. And I mean, Norway is blessed to have so much possibilities to create beautiful stuff out of wood. So that will be part of recreating local industries which will have to come. And we probably need the change in the global economy and the systems and the rules to make it happen. That's, that's the only thing that makes sense. Eh? So what makes sense should be also economically viable. And that should be the goal. So this is about transition towns. I mentioned about transition towns in South America and then the same in Denmark. We are having a transition town coming up. And uh, I know that the East has been working a lot with the transition town movement and she's very close to the leaders of that in, in England. And the way I see it is that we have the content. Everything that happens in ecovillages are being done in one or other ecovillage uh, uh, transition town. I mean, we have the content, we have developed it. They can come to us for education programs, and they have, to, uh, uh, they have found a, a way of implementing, of getting local people involved, creating these 12 steps and so forth. So the two movements, they fit together like this. And I think that eventually they might also become one. And as I see it, what we really need and the media is starting spreading all the good news. Our, one of our problems, that's what I talked, I said, and I was lucky to sit with Eric Daman yesterday, and he, he said that he thought that the biggest problem was our media, and I totally agree with him. We need some media who starts spreading the good news about what's possible, about all this, uh, and they are not interested because so far they think they are the servants of the. Uh, Systems, say, the big corporate systems, and they, they don't believe that this is going to be the future. The moment they believe this is the future, they'll change. Eh? And we need to influence them, or we need to create some new media. And I think that if the transition towns and the families, uh, green families, and eco villages, and permaculture, and uh, the culture, the green economics, if all these movements go together. I think we could create some really fantastic uh, media. It could be on the internet, but we, we also need something to hold in our hands.
to show that this is happening and this is uh, the future. This economic design. We will have an economic book here. We teach that and uh, it's very popular with, with our courses, this uh, economic design. One, one thing is that we, when we talk about design, we distinguish between the structural design and the physical design. And a lot of what we've been talking about here is the structural design, which really decides how things are going to be. But when we talk about integrated eco design, we are thinking very much about the physical. This is just to show you. Social design is important because for people to learn to live in equality, they need to relearn social skills, which they have forgotten. As a culture, we have forgotten to how to solve conflicts. We are afraid of conflicts. We think that they'll ruin our lives, and uh, we would rather be alone or be ourselves than than nobody can hurt us. But once you work with conflict resolution and realize how much fun there is in, in solving conflicts with people you like, uh, then you begin to see the possibilities for creating more, much more alive, uh, vibrant uh, communities. So I think that our social design uh, section is a really important part of, of the Who is this guy education for? It's just look at the way I read it. I don't know what happened to it. The thing is, it's, uh, I think it basically is, of course, it's for people who want to create an ignorance, but it's also for university students. That really many university students now who write their thesis on ignorance and so forth. Uh, I hear about new projects every day. We are also for architects and planners, gardeners, farmers, when they all need to have this holistic concept of what's possible for the future and what they can be part of creating. So a great many people, civil servants, they need to sit in the administrations and start realizing that they have to support this kind of development because the other the existing uh, liberal economics system just kind of continues. So they need to be part of uh, inventing the future. So they need to have this holistic vision, know what they're dealing with, visit the places, to see what uh, what joy it is and what solutions make sense. <laughs> I haven't invented this system of where you get one thing pops up after the other. I guess it was two pages in, in, in the other presentation and I tried to get it together in one place. So, so basically I think that, I, I personally think it ought to be like we had in the old days, a philosophical, a philosophical introduction to anything you study, any topic. I went through it, and I think that this would be good for any uh, topic at the university to have a one month holistic introduction to what is it that we need to do in society, what are all the things that we need to get together, and then they can go on studying some uh, topics. I think it should be like an introduction at the university. Uh, but that's my personal opinion. Oh, that's me. So that's what I talked about that uh, UNESCO has chosen us to be represented in Bonn. And here's a picture where we were one of the few uh, educational projects who actually ex uh, had an exhibition at this midway conference in Bonn uh, of the decade. 
So that's a few years ago. And it's based uh, from uh, Guy Education and Kasia from uh, the Global News Network. If you so I, I was when I started making this presentation, uh, this uh, inter, PowerPoint presentation, I was really thinking that I should be talking about integrated design, but I felt that. It was important to be a more um, historical and, and uh, overview. Uh, what we have developed was is that we have the social design. So I show what, what are social design. What is social design? How is social design reflected in the physical surroundings? Or, or what is ecological design? So I've tried to work with all these different elements of design, which is possible. And what I think is that that a designer, uh, uh, when you have taken this education, what you if you come to, if a group comes to you and you, they want your help to create the what we, the designer should have a role as a midwife, helping them, telling them what are the possibilities they have. So it should be you in the group who decides what their life should be like. So so from yes, I think that the planners should. In this context, really, the midwives more than the ones taking the lead. It should not be developed it, and that could easily happen. That uh, that big firms would start developing the business, and I think that a lot, lot of the importance would happen because the process of people really finding out what they want in their life, how they want to live. And we could, we should. Uh, jump. Uh, we shouldn't uh, leave that out. It's important that people go through this process and creating this equipment just create transform people. So here I just took a few designs that I found. This was I found the other day on the internet. That's what I showed. The new part of the development. It's not all the land. They have a lot of, of land around it. But this is uh, how they have structured the first part of the settlement they have the permission to be 150,000 and this would be like four thousand is that so? Thirty houses, yeah. This is the first thirty. Oh thirty houses. Yeah. So that would be like a cluster yeah. and then there will be more common up there. And I think it's, it looks beautiful. With the common house and, <laughs> and the and the you will explain that because in the course of the afternoon, probably because you're the uh, person who has uh, taken the initiative to hold that shirt because I thought when your wife was sitting next to you. And we went there yesterday and it was a wonderful experience. I think it has incredible potential, that place. Uh, the placement of nature. I, I, I really want to go and live there. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <Yeah. laughs> Well, I, I have seven grandchildren in this one. Mm. I just couldn't leave it. But I, we, I think it's, it's an ideal place that, to create a, 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 new, a new, whole new society. And just to give you a few pictures that, that you probably wouldn't see else, it's in Korea they have a very, very powerful Igorilis movement. And they work with the official authorities and they are given all the resources that they need, and that's what a communistic country can do. It's, it's a good sign about communism, that they don't have to fight with the liberal economies and all these bigger corporations. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's not communist, but the, it, the, they have a different structure, and it's much easier to get things done like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, but they have a different tradition and, and uh, is it, I thought it was half, like half on this, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, but. But I was just so impressed when I met these people and how ready they were and how they were building and how they were, how, how was nothing preventing them from doing what they thought was uh, going to happen. And this is another project that I just would like to show to you. I know it's terrible quality, but you can see the houses. 
And what is interesting about it, it's a, it's a small village, a fisher village in Sri Lanka, which was built after the tsunami. The Sabotia, which has an organization of 16,000 villages in Sri Lanka, they were the first there to help. And they get, got all these local fishermen and women together, and together with them they designed this settlement. And they got a lot of the new ecological ideas and social ideas into this. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic that having an organization like uh, the Sabote that they are capable of doing this and they have actually also helped uh, in uh, Japan after the, uh, the, the catastrophes last year. They were one of the first to come and offer their help and they have been able to this in Japan helping the Japanese which is kind of incredible. But they have the model and I think that in the future, the, the eco-village designers, they have a, a really role because we'll see a lot of more disasters with the weather patterns. Uh, they have a real role in recreating communities and getting the social aspects and the economics and all the aspects in building really sustainable communities uh, instead of just putting up some very quickly, quick, uh, concrete things. Eh? So I see a future that we can help the world in doing things this way. And this is Farm. Ors and I were invited there this year. Uh, this weekend they are inaugurating a, a center for renewable energy in Galkafarm in Hungary. And uh, they have built this eco in a few years since we were there. This is a model that they showed us like uh, five years ago. And since then they have built a whole, a whole issue. And, uh, I know that in the, up in your eco village you say, you say that what's really important in the eco village is to start with a common house. And I agree that starting with a common house is a good idea. But what really makes an eco village happen is a fire soul. And in Galka Farm they have, have uh, Gesa Varga. He's a member of parliament and he has been the head of the, of the what is that called? Via Campesina. Via Campesina. This is a organi global organization of small farmers. So he's been very active. And now he's built this in a few years because he had the will to do it. And he got the money from the EU. He managed to somehow. So we need fire souls, uh, bulldozers that are capable of keeping the goal and doing it and make it happen because it's tough. It's tough work. You spent 10 years. Fantastic. And uh, we need people who are ready to do that because it's not easy. It. You have to fight with so many things, but I think uh, in Roskilde, I have a whole PowerPoint with designs, but I, I don't want to show any more here because I take more time than uh, it's, uh, it's mine already. But uh, I was going to say something. It just. Yeah, in, in Roskilde, in Montgisagor, which is the most modern eco villages, the most mainstream eco villages. I thought I think I have to tell you that. Yeah, this is from Montgisagor. You see, it's five clusters one youth cluster, one senior, and then three family clusters. And each cluster has a common house. And in the middle, they have the whole farm where they have meeting spaces and, and other stuff. Right? It's a project uh, near Copenhagen and next to the Roskilde University Center. And what's interesting is that in that community, because of this project, which has had a lot of resistance, a lot of problems, now the local mayor is promoting eco-villages. They have been building, I think, five or six co-houses since this was started. So I will, we will be reaching very soon a level where it's become evident that this is a good solution. And what makes a good solution is that they are good taxpayers. They have good jobs, they are, they are serious people, they do the things. And, and the local authorities have to discover that very quickly. Mm -hmm. So now, Ecovis in Denmark have become very popular. So I hope it will mean that it will take off. Can you say that once more? The last thing that you said, I didn't get it. What was, what was great? Well, the, in the eco villages, people they pay their taxes. They are good taxpayers, and that's interesting because that's not what you would think about. Uh, that the eco villages, that that's why they become popular. But that's that's what I've heard. 
And of course, uh, they also like that they cooperate and, and they have, don't have any problems and children function well and Jewish, they come and be kids. So of course, a lot of may, uh, local mayor, he, he would like that. Right? So when, the, when people starting going to visit uh, your new school up there and, and who are you going to see you have 20,000 visitors a year, then the local authorities will say, ah, this was a good decision. Eh? <laughs> Thank you very much.